Hi, Tim Two Wheels here, and on this how-to video, we're gonna do something a little bit different. We're actually gonna fabricate our own custom rear rack for a KLR 650. So stick around, we'll get started right after this. So I've been looking around for a, a good, sturdy rear rack for the uh, back of my KLR. And you know, there's, there's a lot of replacement plates out there and some racks, but I, I just couldn't find anything that would serve the purpose that I want it to serve. And what is that? Well, first of all, I want a larger surface area than what comes on the KLR. Here's the stock rear rack for a KLR 650. As you can see, it's okay, but it's not really good if you want to pile a lot of gear on. This thing measures about 10 and a half inches wide by about 12 inches deep or long, however you want to look at it. What I wanted to do is to extend beyond that and also make it wider. Uh, there's uh, dirt racks and a few other companies out there have some, some nice uh, bolt-on aluminum or you can find some steel ones out there, uh, racks that bolt onto this same frame. What I wanted to do was to extend the frame and make it sturdier. So I typically ride in one of two modes. Uh, one of which is I call my street mode, which is where I'm either on the road by myself or I have my wife with me riding two up. In that situation, I have a GV top case that I have on the bike. And uh, that serves a couple of purposes. One is for extra storage. And two, it gives my wife a nice backrest when we're riding to help make her feel more secure. The second mode is dirt mode or camping. Uh, so in this situation, I wanted a much larger rear rack uh, with slots in it for rock straps, bungee cords, whatever you want to use to tie down gear. The gear I would throw on there would be camp chairs, sleeping bags, tents, uh, all the other gear stuffed typically in dry sacks uh, uh, and piled up on that rear rack. But I wanted something substantial to hold the load securely and give it support and not have it droop over the sides or, or over the back. So with those two modes, I wanted to be able to interchange relatively easily. So what I've decided to do is to fabricate my own custom rear rack uh, that would bolt onto the, the mounts that are there, uh, the side mounts with the handles, um, and it would, also, it would be stronger, it would also be longer, and uh, allow me to have an interchangeable system to where with, with six recessed metric bolts, I could remove one plate and put the other plate on the permanent steel rack. So let's take a closer look at the design I've come up with. So here's a closer look at uh, what I'm actually uh, fabricating. Um, here's a layout. None of this is, is welded together yet. But this gives you an idea of what the rear frame will look like on the bike. The rack that comes on a KLR650 is this size here. Now I have my GV, uh, my mounting base for my uh, GV monolock case on here. And I had it hanging over, you can see I had it hanging over the rear of the rack a few inches here to give me enough room. Uh, so the original factory rack was 12 inches long by on the insides here it was 10 and a half inches wide about 11 and a half inches to the outsides here so what i was looking for was something a little more utilitarian something uh, a little more rugged that i could uh, use to strap uh, equipment to 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 go on a long extended trip so what i came up with was this idea uh, to use a one inch square tubing steel tubing uh, to put together a framework that would extend, um, basically it would bolt directly to the existing mounts um, on the KLR and then extend over uh, longer than uh, the stock. The factory uh, plate is 12 inches, which would come to about here, so about where this last cross member is. Uh, and then I, I extended it out to 18 inches overall. So that's going to have the rack extend out over the original location uh, six inches, uh, which should give me a little more room. I wanted a very sturdy uh, steel uh, base uh, that I could have that would stay mounted to the bike uh, using the original mounting locations. And I'll get into the detail about the mounting here in just a moment. 
uh, but then I wanted to have uh, interchangeable top plates. Uh, so I'm drilling and tapping uh, mounting screws into the framework. And that way I'll just be able to take out six uh, recessed screws and exchange it for another top plate that has a different purpose. For my type of riding, I have two basic needs. One is uh, road or street mode where I'll have a plate that I will um, mill out of this aluminum uh, sheet here that I ordered. And uh, it will be essentially the exact size of this framework. And then I'll have room to mount my uh, GV top case lock on here and still have a little bit of room to strap something on if I, if I want to. The second mode is gonna be uh, off-road or my, <laughs> as I like to refer to it, my pickup truck mode. Uh, so I'm gonna have a 24 by 24 inch piece of aluminum that I will have mounted on here. And I'm gonna mill slots in it and turn up the edges accordingly. And that'll give me a nice big platform uh, for throwing on uh, backpacks, um, sleeping bags, uh, dry bags stuffed full of gear, whatever I want. Uh, I could even haul firewood on this thing if you want to, and then strap it all down. The tubular steel is, is pretty strong, and you could use it as is uh, and just drill holes through it and, and bolt. The original uh, bolts that came with this are these a metric uh, cap head. There's six millimeter by one millimeter pitch threads, uh, cap head socket uh, screws uh, or bolts, whatever you want to refer to them, that went through to the frame. Uh, I could have used these, but the heads would have uh, been on top of the steel and, and stuck up proud of the surface. And I didn't really want that. What I wanted was a flush finish. So I, I got online at, at boltdepot.com and uh, uh, ordered the screws. I, I couldn't find anything like this at my local hardware stores. Uh, if you have a specialty uh, bolt shop in your area, they could probably help you out with this. But if you don't, uh, check out boltdepot.com. They had, this, had all of the uh, hardware that I needed. Plus, uh, the hardware, you can order them individually, and they're a lot cheaper than what you can typically buy them locally. Yes, you have a little bit of a shipping cost, but it's not much on something like this. So you can order by the individual pieces, by the box, whatever you want. So as you can see, I ordered eight, six millimeter by one inch, by one millimeter thread pitch, by 35 millimeter length on these. And then I also ordered eight of the 40 millimeter length, same screws. So they look like this. They're an oil coated, oil finished. These are uh, the super hard 12.9 uh, uh, bolt hardness. Uh, and uh, they have a, a flush head with a, uh, um, a hex a hex wrench head fitting in there. So when they're mounted, uh, if you'll notice on this piece, I've already drilled in countersink, so it sets perfectly flat with the top of the of the frame. So, like I said, you could have just drilled through the tubular steel. Uh, the square tube steel is pretty strong, and you could have just put it in here like so, and just went through and not had any filler in here. But I wanted to make this very strong, plus I needed a way to mount my rack to the frame. And this 14 gauge thickness was not going to give me enough thread to thread that, uh, to tap that and thread it. So what I decided to do was to take solid steel inserts. Uh, so I've got here some, uh, it was originally a 7 8 by 7 8 inch steel uh, bar stock, which you can see here. And then it was just barely too big to fit in here. So on two surfaces, I took an angle grinder and I ground down just a little bit, enough off of it, so that it now slides right inside the one inch steel tubing, like so. Now on the end here, I just slid it right in. I cut these in two inch lengths. And what that did is it, if I hold it here beside of it, you'll see it gave me enough room to drill through, give me a solid uh, bar mounting surface that I could countersink. I don't have to worry about the pipe collapsing or crushing in any way. And then over here, I was able to drill a hole to tap for my six millimeter thread. And what that's gonna allow me to do 
is uh, to mount my plate and, and screw right into this as a solid uh, bar uh, with threads all the way through. So I've done that here and also back here at this mounting point, uh, I slid the uh, segment up in here and on the bottom side uh, drilled a small hole just enough to penetrate through and then uh, did a, um, uh, a spot weld to hold it in place. So that's holding that in place. On top of that, I went ahead and drilled through and did my countersink. So again, the threads will go all the way through, or the, the screw will set flush with the top. So the, um, there's gonna be six mounting points here. And again, this is laid out roughly, but um, I'll have a mounting point to the frame here and here, and then I'll have drill and tap uh, here here and then two back here. So I'll have a total of six mounting plate mounting points for the plates to sit on top. A little bit more about how the plates are going to work. Here's just a, a scrap piece of aluminum of the same thickness. Uh, and you'll see um, I've been able to countersink and uh, to give a nice flat surface. So a screw, when I, when I mount this, the screw will go in, it sets flush with the top. From Bolt Depot, I also order these uh, nylon spacers that will go here, and then this will screw into the pipe to hold it, or to the frame to hold it in place. Now, uh, you may wonder why I wanted the spacer between the plate and the actual, uh, the rack plate and the rack frame. Uh, so let me, let me show you here real quick. So when this is screwed down, you'll get an idea of how that's going to look. We'll just snug it up. But the aluminum plate will set up uh, off, of the, um, off of the frame. And the reason I wanted to do that is uh, to allow me to run straps underneath the top plate and the frame. Uh, when this is mounted to the bike, it would be harder to do. So that's one reason. The second reason is that in the edges of the plate, as it runs along, I'm gonna mill out uh, two inch slots. Uh, in the aluminum and what that's going to allow me to do is to either hook a bungee cord or to uh, use my rock straps to feed through there uh, and you know how rock straps work they kind of feed through the loop on the end and come back up and cinch tight so that'll give me a good sturdy uh, place to to mount this uh, and keeping it up off of here just enough that if I wanted to run rope through or whatever the case may be uh, I, I could do so so that gives you a rough idea of how that's going to look I'll have a detailed drawing with measurements uh, on my website and I'll have a link below for you to click uh, to uh, pull that up if you want to try to build something along this line or take my design and modify it for your own use. Uh, here for this cross piece, on the, um, the factory plate mounts basically in uh, six places. It has the two along the side and then it has these two holes here that go down and through the rear fender and bolt into the subframe itself. Uh, so these two holes are what is going to be replaced by this. So I took uh, just a piece of my square tubing and I've welded, it was one and a quarter inch angle iron, so I cut a little bit off this top edge here and then I welded along the bottom and along here. Of course I've ground it down and I've got my, whole lo my bolt locations marked here. I still need to drill those out and I'll do that before I weld it all together. So essentially, the frame will be hollow tubing, uh, except for the, the ends, of course, where I'll have the two inch bar stock inserted and welded around here. Back here, the bar stock will be inserted up to this point and I'll have it spot welded to hold it in place, plus it'll be drilled through and bolts will be holding it. And then along this back edge, I'll also insert some of the uh, bar stock to make my two uh, mounting locations for the uh, top plate. But otherwise, this will be welded up. Another little feature that uh, I'd like to talk about here is this. Uh, this will be the rear of the rack. This will be facing the front of the bike where the seat is. Uh, on this rear, I did not want just a square, um, a square turn, a, a, a 90 degree angle with 45 degree miters cut into it. Um, that would have been fine, I guess, but I didn't want the sharp point back here that you could potentially uh, hit uh, back into, run into, um, because it's on um, the, it's hanging over the back edge of the bike some. So what I opted to do instead was cut 
uh, 22 and a half degree angles on this piece and this piece. And of course, 22 and a half plus 22 and a half gives you a 45 degree angle. Do that again here, 22 and a half, and that gives you another 45 degree angle. So that's given us our complete 90 degree bend here. Uh, and these are uh, two inches on this inside uh, length here. Uh, so this runs out uh, 16 inches. This is another two inches. And then this gives us uh, across the back to complete it. So the overall length of the rack again is uh, 18 inches with an overall width here of 10 and a half inches to fit inside the, uh, the mounting point. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and finish uh, building this side by putting the inserts in, drilling and tapping it. The same with this back piece. And then the next step after that would be to uh, go ahead and start to uh, weld this together. Uh, one little word about welding. Um, I have a, a MIG welder that I'm using to uh, put this together with. Uh, if you don't have a welder, um, you can possibly, um, you know, find uh, someone local who, who, is, who is a welder or take it to a fabrication shop and see if they would build this for you. Uh, if I didn't say so before, uh, this one inch tubing you can pick up uh, at Lowe's or Home Depot or possibly any other of your local hardware stores. Uh, again, this is one inch steel tubing, 14 gauge thick. Uh, you can cut it uh, using either a cutoff wheel on an angle grinder or a, if you have a, a steel or metal chop saw, uh, you can use that to, uh, to cut and get the nice clean edges and, and then file those. So when welding this 14 gauge steel, this is a sample piece that I was just experimenting with, trying to get the welds right. Um, and uh, one tip is when you're welding material, this is relatively thin. Make sure you got your power set. And then basically you can't run a full bead on material this thin or you'll start to blow through or melt uh, the, the material and then you'll get holes. Uh, so what I ended up doing was tack welding at the corners, just spots, and to hold it together, you wanna be careful and not weld one whole side because it'll start to draw the material. Uh, if you do this, just do a series of spots is basically what it is. Uh, that gives your material a chance to cool down in between welds. And then when you finish the whole thing, it'll, it'll come out relatively well. Uh, I, this is after welding it up and then I ground it down. I still need to do some work on this to make it uh, perfect. But that's how you can weld uh, this 14 gauge steel without... Um, without blowing through or getting melt through, or I call it blow through. Um, you can call it whatever you want. I'm not a professional welder. Um, I'm just, I just weld for my own purposes and as a hobby. So at any rate, doing a series of those spot welds, you can get a fairly decent weld. Now this is using flux core, uh, flux core uh, wire. I don't have gas on my welder. Um, so it's a little rough, but by the time uh, and this has not been ground down or anything You can take this and then hit it with a sanding wheel flap disc and it'll it'll look uh, pretty darn good All right, so enough talking I'm gonna go ahead now and start uh, fabricating some of these pieces and then put it all together <laughs> 